glad to see all of you tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, the last few Sundays, not this past Sunday, but a couple Sundays before that, I've been trying to bring up to speed a lot of the people about understanding God's will for your life. And it's becoming more and more apparent to me that when I think people should know certain things, they don't. And I see people making horrific decisions. Anybody here ever made a, not just a bad decision, a horrific decision? And I'm trying to um, help everybody, especially the new people. We got a lot of new people in our church who just need to learn. So a couple of Sundays ago, I talked about um, five ways of knowing God's will. We talked about scriptural direction, that you follow the word, of following the authorities in your life, godly counsel, um, provision, and circumstances. What is, uh, in addition to that, that I want to talk about tonight, because even all five of those areas, the enemy can use. So... Uh, if you're not careful, the devil will use scripture to make you think you're doing something that's God's will and it's not God's will. How many of y'all know that the devil can quote more verses than all of us in here put together? And he can uh, um, orchestrate circumstances and he can, he can make provisions. I think I said in some of the services, you talk about provisions because some people think if you need money for something and you don't have it, then you get the credit card in the mail, you say, look at God. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, God ain't in the credit card. <laughs> that, that wasn't God. Um, or um, just, you know, I, I want to further dive into this, and I've I'm going to talk on something tonight that I've talked about before, and I sometimes I feel like I don't need to talk about it again, but it's apparent to me that I do. I want to talk about discerning God's voice, discerning how you know when it's God talking to you. And amen. Thank all two of y'all for that. Appreciate it very much. Um, because there are distinctions, distinct traits when God's talking and they're distinct traits when the enemy is talking. Amen. And it's critical that you know the difference. Yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, glory. Um, my family has a late spirit upon them. <laughs> it's in the whole family. Yeah. So can y'all point in my direction and pray, Lord, go ahead, point at me, say, Lord, deliver the pastor's family from a late spirit. <laughs> point right at me. I'm taking, because I'm late sometimes too. I'm late often. So I'm, I'm examining myself first before I look at anybody else. <laughs> um, so anyway, I want to talk about the distinctions, how you know the difference. And there's a way you can know clearly when it's God and when it's not God. You got to know those traits. And I want to start off by talking about um, uh, the traits of God's voice. Let's start with that. Well, let me start off with Hebrews uh, uh, 5. I didn't give them this verse, so this is not going to come up on the screen because I didn't give it to them. But let me just uh, give you Hebrews 5. I wasn't going to do this. I wasn't going to talk here, but I, just, I changed my mind. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the last two verses of Hebrews 5. And it says, verse 12, 13, and 14, actually, I'm going to read those last three verses. It says, Hebrews 12, verse 5, uh, verse 12. 
of Hebrews 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. For solid food, somebody say solid food, belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to do what? Discern both good and evil. And in the course of our life, we've got to be able to discern the difference between what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. And the devil's voice is, is evil, God's voice is good. And we've got to be able to know what those differences are. So I want to walk down through um, the five traits of God's voice and the five traits of the enemy's voice. Uh, here's the first one. When God talks to you, he rules by peace. Um, Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful let the peace of God rule in your heart somebody say the peace of God the peace of God that's an inner peace 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, has in all the churches of the saints. God is a God of peace. And peace means God brings harmony between individuals. Um, um, when he says, when Colossians says, let God rule by peace, it means you allow him to govern, help you make decisions and make determinations for your life uh, with peace. This is not saying that um, peace means that there will be the absence of turmoil externally. Let me give that to you again. Let me say that again. When he talks about peace, see, some people, here's what I hear a lot of people say. Let me break it down like this. Some people make decisions that are opposite of God, but because they don't have no more drama in their life, they think that's the peace of God. So in other words, um, you leave your marriage and now you say you feel at peace. <laughs> and you're saying that because there's no more turmoil, there's no more fighting or arguing or whatever. That's not the answer. When God's talking about peace, that's not the kind of peace he's talking about. The, the, this, this peace that God is talking about is an internal peace that does not equate to the fact that there's no more drama on the outside. When you got the peace of God, even if there is drama on the outside, there'll be something quieted inside of you. So don't confuse the absence of drama with the peace of God. Because sometimes you can be right in the middle of God, Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, jot this down, I don't have time to turn there, but jot down Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. Take it down because I know you're going to go home and read it. The disciples were in, were obeying the Lord. He gave them instructions to get on a boat, go to the other side of the river, or the other side of the sea. They got in the boat, and while they were on their way, they encountered a storm. But yet they were in the middle of God's will. You can, have, you can be in the middle of a storm and be right in the middle of God's will. Things are not going right for you. That's, we're not, I'm, you can have the peace of God and be right in the middle of a storm, right in the middle of drama. God has the capacity to bring you that, that peace in the middle of a storm. Now, having said that, let me add this to it. In the book of Jonah, jot this book down, Jonah chapter 1. Read Jonah when you get an opportunity. Jonah, God gave, God, God gave Jonah some instructions, told him to go to Nineveh. He decided he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He wanted to go to Tarshish, so he jumps on a ship, pays the fare. Now he's headed to Tarshish and because he's outside of the will of God, they encounter a storm. I think it's interesting that you got two scenarios here. One where it is the will of God and you're in the storm and one where it's not the will of God and you're in the storm. So here, here he's outside of the will of God and he's in the middle of a storm and the, and, the, and the sailors on board the ship are trying to get control of the ship in the midst of the storm. And Jonah is downstairs in the bottom of the ship sleep. Now, 
his drama has caused drama for everybody else. It's caused hell for everybody else. And I think that we have to learn to discern that when God is speaking to you and when God is giving you direction, you peace can be one of the components of it, but make sure that the peace is a peace from God because you're obedient to God, not because you're disobeying God. I'm going to come back to that in a few moments. Let me go to number two. I'll highlight that a little bit more in a few more minutes. No fear. This is, this is an important point that God does not govern us or speak to us using fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7 said, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So anytime fear is in the picture, I know y'all heard me talk about that a hundred times, if you've been here for any length of time. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God gives us a sound mind. He gives us stability. He does not want us to be afraid. And when you read in the scriptures, uh, multiple times God talks about no fear. Uh, at least 11 times it says fear not. 50 times it says do not fear. Anytime fear comes in the picture, you can rest assured it's not God talking. If something is trying to make you, force you to make a decision, and that decision is birthed out of fear, you can right off the bat determine that it's not from God. Because God does not use fear to drive you to do anything. That fear is from the enemy. That is the voice of the enemy. It's not from God. Here's number three. Not by quick deadlines. In Isaiah 28, 16 and Isaiah 52, 12, it talks about not making hasty decisions. Some of you have made some quick, hasty decisions and they, they, they were wrong. And you need to know right off the bat, if you got deadlines, you know, quick deadlines, not that, not that there's anything wrong with a deadline, but if you got a quick deadline, that you don't have time to go and pray, you don't have time to see God about it, it's a quick deadline in a hurry, then it's not from God. God does not operate by giving you a quick deadline because God is not governed by time. He's not restricted by time. So anytime somebody come and tell me you got to make a decision about such and such time, I already know the answer. Because God is not governed by time. If you're telling me I have to do this by a certain time frame, then it's not God. Whoever, the Bible says, if you're a believer, you do not act hastily. That's what 28.16 says of Isaiah. Isaiah 52.12 says, you shall not go out with haste. You shall not go out and do it quickly. You, 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 you don't rush into decisions. That's an important point. Do not rush in, in, into decisions. Do not rush. Tell your neighbor, don't rush in quick decisions. Take your time. Don't make quick, don't feel, don't feel rushed to make quick deadlines, quick, quick things. Here's number four. When God speaks, he's, his voice speaks good things. Philippians 4 verse 8 talks about a series of things of whatever's lovely and pure and all of these things, we should think on these things, meditate on these things. Finally, my, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. When the devil's talking to you, he's going to speak horrific things. And even when God has something to challenge you with, he says it in a nice way. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. That's God giving you a warning to turn your life around, but he says it in a good way, in a positive way. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be his scarlet, they shall be his white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be his wood. God, God always gives hope. This is the thing, that God speaks to us hopeful things. He gives hope. When you meet somebody who is devastated by something, you know what you got to do to, to give them uh, 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 strength? Speak hope to them. Tell them tomorrow's going to be a better day. You're crying today, but you ain't going to cry forever. Tomorrow's going to be a better day.
So speak good things. Speak positive things. That's what God's voice does. He tells us positive, hopeful, excellent, pure, holy, innocent, lovely, friendly things. True things. And anything that doesn't fit that category is outside of the will of God. Here's number five. It is in harmony with the whole counsel of God. When, God, when God's speaking to you, he ain't going to tell you something that is in contradiction with another verse of scripture or another principle of the word. Um, I think I said a few weeks ago, this lady told me one time, God told her to uh, take her tithes and pay her bills. That's the wrong answer. That wasn't from God. God is never going to tell you to do something uh, that's going to make you be in conflict with another principle of his word. So if you think God is showing you his will and is causing you to have to con be in contradiction to a principle, then that's not from God. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This word that God's given to us is all inspired by God and it all works together. They don't contradict each other. If there's a contradiction, then there's a misinterpretation or a misapplication, but the scriptures are crystal clear and if you have to violate one scripture to, to what, you, what you feel like is to obey another scripture, you're outside of it. That's not God talking to it. That, that's not his voice. Now, let me go to the, the, to the devil's voice. Um, let me just tell you a couple things real quick that, that I don't have notes on, but I'm just going to just lay this out to you. First of all, there's several places in the scripture where we see the devil talks, and here's what's consistent about his voice. He always misquotes the scriptures or speaks lies. When you see the places where the devil is talking in scripture, he's either misquoting scripture, using it out of context, or just telling an outright lie. He's the father of lies. And we'll talk about this in a few moments too, He's going to question the character of believers. Anytime somebody's coming along and they're questioning somebody's character, their intention, their motives, their heart, that's demonic. I'm going to prove it to you in a few moments. Here's number one. It challenges God's declared truths and boundaries. The devil, when he talks, did God really say? Is that what he really meant? Genesis chapter 3, these first five verses. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. He had, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, now there's, a, there's a misquote right there. Because God said, just don't eat from one tree. He said, did God say you can't eat from every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. There's a lie right there, I'll write lie. You won't die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He's a liar. Somebody say, that devil is a liar. He's going to challenge boundaries. He's going to say, that is not really what the scripture meant. When it's ever so clear, and, and the devil will tell you, well, it don't, it don't apply to you. You know, I always meet somebody who feel like they, they special. And it don't, it don't apply to you. This, this restriction, this boundary, this challenge, it doesn't apply to you. 
But the fact of the matter is it does apply to you. Here's number two. He seeks to pull you away from God's divine purposes and plans for your life. I wish everybody was as enthusiastic as you are over there. He seeks to pull you away from what God's divine purposes are for your life and God's plan for your life. And we see this demonstrated when in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus was headed to his death, his purpose, and the devil uses Peter to try to pull him off course. And that's in Matthew chapter 16 verses 21, 22, and 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus telling the disciples this. Then Peter, verse 22, took him aside. Peter took Jesus aside. I got an email this week from one of our members who never preaches, but they took a preaching class. So they, 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 they pulled me to the side in an email and said, we learned, Pastor, in our preaching class that your subject ain't supposed to be more than seven words. Right there. Got me up here counting these words. If living in a glass house, don't throw no stones. <laughs> don't get nobody no advice if you ain't done it yourself. And I said, the nerve. <laughs> Peter pulls Jesus to the side. Verse 22, then Peter took him aside and look, and began to rebuke him. Saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Yeah, can I go back and read verse 21 again? From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he, what? Must go to Jerusalem. And he must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And be raised the third day. He said, I'm going to die, but I'm going to get back up again. And Peter pulls him to the side. And we, we find out where that came from in verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Jesus recognized that that didn't come from Peter. It came from the demon that was influencing him. I probably should have emailed the person back and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus is saying to Peter and to the devil, because the devil is thinking uh, in, in humanly terms. I'm going to come to that point in a moment. He's thinking limited. He's thinking in a restricted way. And Jesus re uh, has to rebuke Peter because he, he doesn't understand and rebuke the devil because he's a, he doesn't understand that God's ultimate purpose for Jesus was to come and die on the cross. We wouldn't have, that's the whole reason he came, was to come and die so our sins could be washed away and here the devil is trying to interrupt the plan of God. And, and you gotta know that when you start headed in the course of the destiny of your life, I promise you somebody gonna come along and try to get you off the path of what God has for you. 
that devil going to come along with some other suggestion, some other idea, try to get you on some other course, but you got to know, here's what I know about God, is I look back over my life, I look back over my life, and I know that everything, every job I had, every experience I had, all of my journey, everything that I went through, God was preparing me to do what it is I'm doing right now. And that's the way God works, and that's the way he's working for you and in your life. And if you go back and look over the course of your life, there's things that have happened in your life that God is using to get you prepared for his destiny, and somebody's going to come along and make a suggestion that you abandon all of the things that God's been using to get you ready and try to get you on some other course that's the opposite of what God's will is for your life. And if he can get you off course, that's the devil's plan. If he can get you off course, if he can get you in a place where you're not in the will of God for what God has destined you to do, he will have achieved his goal. But if you stay the course, somebody tell your neighbor, stay the course. Stay the course, stay the course of what God is orchestrating. Go through the doors that are open. Y'all know I'm a prophet. I prophesied a couple of weeks ago that the Eagles was going to win the game. Did y'all hear that? E Somebody say, Pastor, you a prophet. Go ahead and say, you a prophet, Pastor. I think I only did it at 12. I don't think I did it at the other services. But, but I did prophesy that, that the quarterback was going to hand the ball to a running back, and the running back was going to try to go up a hole. And that was such a prophetic, true scripture prophecy. It happened multiple times in the game. Somebody said it happened multiple times. Here's number three. I'm acting like I got on day. The devil speaks to you when you are spiritually and physically weak. Now this is a, this too is a critical thing when you are not at your strongest place. The devil will talk to you. And I tell people, and I want to say this again, never make life-altering decisions when you're weak. Do not make life-altering decisions when you're sick. Don't make life-altering decisions when you're not at your strongest point. That's the devil's ground for, for playing with you, messing with you. Luke chapter 4 the devil tempts Jesus after Jesus had been fasting. Verse number one, let me read these first three verses. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, that's what the devil will do. He'll come talking to you when you're physically weak. Then he, he made this, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. The devil, the devil starts talking to him. And the devil will start talking to you, too, when you're weak. And you have to be wise enough, smart enough, not to allow him to manipulate your thinking. And so don't make life-altering decisions when you're weak. Here's number four. The devil seeks to appeal to your flesh and please your flesh. Say to yourself, that's what got me in trouble, pleasing my flesh. <laughs> and throughout this whole chapter of Luke, the devil talks to Jesus and tries to tempt him and and each thing is a fleshly deal, an ego thing. He tries to appeal to him. In verse 3, he says, If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. This is when Jesus was hungry after he'd been fasting. But Jesus answered and said, answered him saying, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's in verse 4. In verse 6, And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and it 
and I give it to whomever I wish. Let me back up to verse 5. The devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Isn't that amazing? The devil takes the creator of the world up on top of a mountain and say it. All this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. That devil is crazy. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the devil didn't have no right to say that anyway. It already belonged to Jesus. He's already the creator of it all. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him, verse 9, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It, is, it has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So in all of these cases, the devil is trying to speak to uh, appease ego and flesh. And that's what the devil does with you. He wants to appeal to your flesh and your ego. The biggest fights that happen in church is when somebody's ego is threatened. That's what the biggest arguments have been. How somebody feel like they should have been treated a certain way. It's their ego. The, the, God has called us to humility. Don't let your flesh call the shots. If you're not careful, that flesh will take you out. He will make suggestions to destroy your, your flesh and try to make you uh, fall, go down that road and it will always end up in pain and, and tragedy and problems. Here's number five. He's an accuser of the brethren. He accuses. The devil is an accuser. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Here it is, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. This is a trait of the enemy is accusing others. That's a trait of the enemy. In, and I think I've talked to you about this before. Uh, anytime somebody is accusing somebody of something that can't be proven intention motives heart all of that all you can do is accuse somebody you can't prove it those are accusations and that's demonic in nature in Job chapter 1 really when you got it get a chance I didn't give this to them just jot it down now there was a day when the sons of God verse 6 6 through 11 Job 1 there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered and said, answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does God, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Here's what the devil is doing. He is making an accusation against the saints, against Job. 
he is saying, you know what? The reason Job is serving you is because you put a hedge around him. You've protected him. You provided for him. He's, he's making an accusation. If you take all of that away from him, he'll stop worshiping you. If you take that hedge away, if you stop providing for him, he will curse you to your face. And whether you know it or not, the devil is still making that accusation against you and I. He wants to accuse us that the only reason we are serving God is because of what he has done for us. And he put a roof over our head and clothes on our back. And we are grateful for all of that. But we got to be the kind of people that though he slay us, yet we will trust him. The devil will accuse us that if, if we lost everything we had, he, he's, he's making that claim. If we got fired from our job, if our families get ripped apart, will we still worship God? And we got to be at a place of maturity to say that come what may, no matter what comes down the pike, he's still our Lord and still our God, and we will still worship him. He is an accuser of the brother. And I say that to say because you got to be careful and you got to be cautious that you're not spending time accusing people of something that you cannot prove. You are entering into the demonic realm and the devil, matter of fact, he's talking to you all the time about what you ain't. You ain't really saved. You ain't this. You ain't going to do that. He's an accuser. You got to recognize that voice and reject that voice and just don't honor that voice. Don't give way to that voice. The devil's telling you, I was, talk, I was counseling somebody today. And they made me so, I was counseling somebody, and they made me so angry. They said they the hated of God. The God doesn't like them. God hates them. And when they said it the third time, I had to, I have taken all I can take, and I can't take some no more. I had to just come out and say, I wish you would just shut your mouth by keep on repeating that lie about God. God loves you. And just because life is not going the way you want it to go at the moment, doesn't mean that God hates you. You're not hated of God. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Instead of lying on God, try to find out what God's trying to teach you and show you and what character he's trying to develop in you. Stop lying on God like that. You and I got to learn to listen to to recognize when God is talking to us and know that voice and how to recognize the voice that didn't come from God. Some of you are listening to the lies of the devil and his accusations and his voice and everything that he's about and you're believing the stuff he's saying. And my challenge to you today is don't believe what the devil tells you. He is a liar. Somebody look at your neighbor and say he's a liar. All right, I'm done. I'm going to take questions if anybody got any questions. I'm on time. Praise the Lord. First time in a long time. I rushed through all of this because I'm trying to do better with my time. We don't have no questions. All right. Okay. Okay, here comes somebody. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, thank you for that. Hold awesome. on for a minute. They got to turn that mic up so I can hear you. Just on. It's on. It's just not on in the house so I can hear it. They just. They just need a minute. Okay, go ahead. It's up now. Thank you, sir, for that awesome uh, teaching. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, you spoke about Jesus in the wilderness, uh, Luke 4, where he was questioning Jesus about... Um, no, it was the part about uh, him offering the world to Jesus. And you, you made a really great point about, uh, yes, yes, uh, the devil It was offering. so profound, you forgot all about it. That's how good it was. 
I just want to ask the question without giving too much context. What are the weapons and the tools that believers can use to keep remembering the things that God has given them? We only got, this is our weapon right here, the Word of God right here. Know this. Yes. This is our weapon. Matter of fact, uh, Ephesians 6 tells us about our weapons. And one of the weapons, oh, that, that whole Ephesians, man, you shouldn't ask me that question because it's a great question. But Ephesians 6 goes through a whole list of things. Okay. And you should get the series that I've done on this because every piece of the armor in Ephesians 6 represents some component of what we need to have in order to win the war. Uh, we, he, can I read it to you real quick? Yes, sir. Since please. you raised, since we got time and you raised the question. I, re I really need this in this season of my life. I can see God shifting things and I want to stay rooted. So that's why I'm asking. I'm going to quickly hit, hit, this, hit this, but you need to get the series because I can't go through it all. But Ephesians 6, mm -hmm. beginning of verse 10, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means the tricks of the devil. He's a trickster. The Bible says we are not ignorant of his devices. We know his tricks. For we do not, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against four entities, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Each one of those four entities come along with a special trait that goes along with them. Mm -hmm. The series will help teach you what that is. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The evil day is when the, uh, the devil aims all of his guns at you and comes at you with everything that he has. Mm -hmm. If you haven't experienced an evil day, it's coming. There's going to be a day, it's coming. But God says, I want you to be able to withstand because you got the whole arm of God on and having done all that you done done, stand. Hmm. Verse 14, stand therefore having girded your loin, girded your waist with truth. There are seven truths that we should gird our loins with. It's the belt of truth. Everything, that, when, when, the, when, the, when the Roman soldiers put on their, their armor, they had a belt and everything attached to the belt everything attached to this belt so he says put on that belt and there's seven truths that we we talk about and we teach regularly in our church that we need to learn about so that we can uh, have the, the belt of truth on then he says have put on the breastplate of righteousness that that, that deals with the breastplates guards your heart Sorry. that was powerful <laughs> i forgot i had that mic right there the most important thing for you to guard is your heart out of your heart flows the issues of life. The devil will challenge you and try to corrupt your heart, make you bitter, angry, resentful, unforgiveness. And once he's done that, he wins. Because he's got a hold of your heart. He says, guard your heart. And what that means, you put yourself in a position that you don't allow your heart to get corrupted. Don't get bitter with people. You got to learn to forgive. Let it go, Louis. Tell your neighbor, let it go, Louis. Release it. You, you all mad, upset with people trying to get them back. They done gone on with their life. They, they roll on, and you, you're, you're stuck because you are bitter and upset, and, and you haven't forgiven, and you can't move forward with that. God wants us to learn how to guard your heart with the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's, uh, that's put, on your, put on your feet the ability to share the gospel. One of the things that every believer has to be capable of doing is how to share the gospel with somebody. We have, we have in our church about 600 altar counselors. Out of 11,000 people who come, we got 600 people who are altar counselor qualified. Meaning they, they've taken the train and they know how to lead somebody to the Lord. That means we have over 10,000 people who don't think it's important for them to learn how to share the gospel. When you, want the whole foot, when you want the whole arm of God on, you got to be prepared, have your feet shod, that no matter where you walk, you are prepared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. <laughs> then it says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The devil will aim his fiery darts, lit, lit darts, darts that are on fire. He says, we defeat those with faith. 
We got to be people of faith that we believe God no matter what our circumstances are. I, I believe God's going to make a way. You, you got to tell yourself in the midst of the most trying times, I know somehow God's going to make a way for me out of nowhere. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know he's going to make a way somehow. I don't know. I don't know how soon it's going to happen, but somehow, some way, I believe God. Everything in the past, y'all excuse me for a second, I feel like shouting right now, because everything you experience in your past is preparing you to deal with your future right today. Everything I cried about, everything I struggled about, everything I've gone through is preparing me to walk in faith with what I'm going through right now. Hey! Somebody high by your neighbor say, I believe God. He's going to make a way. looks impossible. I know it looks like it can't change. I know it looks like I'm going to lose, but I believe God. Moses thought they were going to get killed by Pharaoh's army, but God opened up the waters and they walked across on dry ground. The Hebrew boys thought they were going to be burnt in the fiery furnace, but God kept them in the midst of the fiery furnace. Daniel looked like he was going to be eaten by the, the lion, but God shut the mouth of the lion by faith. Faith, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation. That's your thought life. Control your thought life. This is how most, most of us get defeated. We can't control our thought life. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If we get this, if we meditate on this, if we think on these things, if we hide this in our heart, if we study this, believe this, walk in this, we shall win and not lose. Where you go? Where'd he go? Did I answer your question? Okay, all right. <laughs> I 
My God. Amen. All right. much to thank God for. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty 
through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God we're going to win we're going to win Anybody want to get saved? Anybody want to join this church? Anybody want to rededicate? Anybody's not sure? Come real quick. That's you. You fall in that category. Unsaved, backslidden, unsure. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Just come on. Unsaved, backslidden, unsure or you're already saved, but you want to be a member of the church. Already walking with God. All right. Y'all come move this stand right here. Hallelujah. Thank you. I believe somebody need prayer. Come on down here. Let me pray for some people who need some prayer today. Amen. Come. <laughs> Hallelujah. First lady, come up here real quick. Since you late, you had to pray for these people. <laughs> Is that your wife? Okay, she better be. You got your hands all over her like that. <laughs> We're winners, y'all. Don't judge your future by your present circumstance. Speak life to yourself and not death. Speak hope to yourself. Learn to recognize the voices that you're listening to. Some of you are listening to the wrong voices and you're making decisions based on listening to the wrong voice. Listen to the voice of God. Amen. 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 And discern. Because whatever, whatever things are lovely and pure and, yeah. and holy, yeah. think on those things. That's his voice. All right? The Lord answers my wife's prayers. She's yeah. a prayer woman, a prayer warrior. Yeah. Not, not that, not that she got she not that she got more closer to God than me. <laughs> It just seems like he answers more for prayers for her than for me. But go ahead. Pray. You go ahead and pray, baby. Okay. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness to us and how you show your loving kindness to us even when we don't deserve it. That's the kind of God you are, and we are privileged that you are our Father. So because we know you're our Father, and because your word is true, and because you are mighty, and you are strong, and because there's no God like you, and because if we had a thousand, a million tongues, we couldn't praise you enough for your goodness, because you are highly exalted above every God, every nation. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's why we come to you, God. So, Lord, we thank you that we are winners. You made us winners. We are the victors because of you, and we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that we can stand on your word and that we can hear you when you talk to us and that when we talk to you, you listen and lean over 
because you want to hear what we have to say. So, Lord, I beseech you on behalf of every person standing here around this altar, God, to you, every concern, every request, we lay it on the altar. And Lord, I pray that you would do according to your word, according to that situation, God, speak to it and cause it to be as you created it since the beginning of time, Father. So Lord, I pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding, God, that we will trust you to cause everything to come in line with your word and with your will. And Lord, we thank you that your word says that no weapon that is formed against us, that's formed against the destiny that you have for us, for our families, for anything that we touch, God, that it would not prosper. So Lord, we love you, we believe you, we stand on your word, God, and we want you to know that our eyes are on you. So have your way, Father. We desire to give the good report so that men would see all our good works and glorify you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We pray now, Lord, in Jesus' name. that you would give us confidence when you're talking to us. Yes, Lord. Rebuke fear, Father, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Help us to stop making decisions that are instigated by the enemy, but help us to make sound decisions with the confidence that you're talking to us. Yes, Lord. Help us to see clearly the doors you're opening for us. Close every door you don't want us to go through. Yes, Lord. Help us hear with clarity your voice. Help us to discern when it's your hand orchestrating the circumstances. When it's your hand guiding our authorities. When it's your hand. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. It's turning around for me around for me yes around for me around for me me. it's turning around around let's declare this tonight Cause the Lord will perfect that concerning me And sooner or later It will turn in my favor It's turning around for me Let's say it one more time Oh, it won't always be like this the Lord will perfect that concerning me. You say it soon or later. It will turn in my favor. Oh, it's turning around for me. Oh, tell me who can save me. Oh! 